All right, so let us take up one more uh, uh, wireless protocol uh, which is uh, quite uh, I would say uh, famous in the IoT world. Hmm. The best way to understand this protocol is to see what is around in the market. So, just to help you a little bit, I went to this uh, website. Uh, this is uh, the uh, robu.in website and I looked up this module. Okay. This module is just I mean randomly I picked this module, it is called DG XB module. Okay. There is something nice about this module and I will tell you what. This module uh, provides you serial data interface, it is it has an onboard RP SMA connector, okay, reverse polarized uh, polarity SMA female. It is operating the 2.4 gigahertz radio. Its interference immunity is uh, interference is mostly restricted to direct spread spectrum technique immunity. It has ADC pins. It has four ADC inputs. Each is 10 bit, and it has 15 digital I/O ports. So, if you have analog sensors, you can connect four of them. If you have digital sensors, you can use them. If you want to connect it to a microcontroller, you can use the UART or SPI or I2C communication, nothing more than that. Just this module alone is sufficient for you to just connect the sensor and be done. You can just deploy it and then it will start sending data. No computation, nothing, it just acquire and, and just communicate. Look at the problem of trying to do all your computation on a gateway or in the cloud and so on. Then this is the best way to, to put it like a end device for acquiring information. Think about the uh, blind example I gave you. The outdoor light sensor can perhaps be equipped with a simple communication device like this and a light sensing module okay, which is basically a, a sensor. Now, if you look at the cost is uh, quite low, good thing is about that example he gives here. Okay, I like this example very much. What he shows here is you look at all these sensors, look at what is actually happening. Here he has a temperature sensor out here, but this temperature sensor is communicating to uh, a gateway uh, and uh, he has a another temperature sensor, but this time it is communicating over the uh, XB3, the DGXB3 module which is running another protocol which we mentioned just now is the Zigbee protocol. And this protocol translation between all these uh, packets between Bluetooth and so on and so forth, uh, how to interpret that packet, everything is known to this basic uh, gateway system, uh, basic device. And essentially, this device in turn uh, has the ability to communicate this via the DGXB gateway, which is essentially this uh, device here, and out onto the internet, right. So, it can go back can go out of the internet. So, essentially you can create a sort of a network which uh, will allow you to uh, make a mesh out of these three uh, nodes with uh, uh, you know including Bluetooth as a possible connection. In other words, uh, this gateway device has the ability to do even protocol translation. It can take Bluetooth convert it to, to native some form it can take Zigbee and then convert it into native form and so on. So, the good thing about it is you do not have to worry about anything with respect to this, uh, this part here because it allows you to just use this straight away with analog sensors uh, interface directly. So, programmability simplicity of creating IoT applications is uh, extremely good with this Zigbee module. But you must know a little more than just uh, you know looking at it from a module perspective, right. So, let us look at formally what this uh, module is all about and get into some details about this module. Well, this module is nothing but defines the MAC and PHY which is defined by the IEEE, IEEE 802.15.4, okay. So, this is the standard which is proposed by the IEEE and it is operating between the MAC and PHY layers. Now, this is the network layer and up here is the Zigbee uh, application layer where applications can use this Zigbee stack 
which is developed by the consortium and start using these API calls for programming this module for either communication for sensing and so on and so forth. Some of the examples of this uh, technology where it can be applied is in structural health monitoring it could be buildings it could be bridges and so, and so on. You will have several of these sensors which are uh, sort of uh, placed there and uh, they can be uh, connected uh, in a mesh topology or uh, they can also be like a tree topology they can be connected and uh, essentially keep on monitoring uh, that bridge or that building in a uh, periodical manner ok. So, it is just about sense and send, sense and send kind of uh, simple application that uh, you may be envisaging. Now, these are essentially very low duty cycle applications extremely low duty cycle. Let me give you an example here I have taken that a Zigbee node uh, remains on for a 60 millisecond period acquires some data does a transmission ok and again goes back to sleep for the remaining time which means every second it just is awake for 60 milliseconds and after which it goes back to uh, sleep. So, you will really get good lifetime if you build systems like what I mentioned uh, now ok. Uh, so, that is a good thing and where would you um, want to apply them as I mentioned on several applications which require not only tree topology. So, you can use it in tree topology or you can also use it in uh, mesh topology ok. So, that is the good thing about the uh, protocol itself. Now, one striking thing about uh, this protocol is that it is low data rate that is why you will get extremely good sensitivity uh, because of the low data rate uh, that it transmits. Uh, it can really survive under extremely high noisy conditions ok what, that is one thing and uh, inherently it has a modulation which is uh, called uh, it is called a spread spectrum uh, modulation. It uses uh, direct spread spectrum uh, modulation scheme uh, which essentially makes it extremely robust to any interference and noise and therefore, extremely suited for this kind of large scale monitoring of uh, um, environments that you have in mind. Uh, as I mentioned data rate being low gives you the advantage of uh, very good uh, receiver sensitivity and uh, therefore, you must know what kind of range this uh, system actually can uh, support. So, we will have a look at that uh, aspect as well. If you look at this picture on the x axis I have drawn the uh, data uh, rate and on the y axis I have shown the power consumption. Z here stands for Zigbee, B stands for Bluetooth and W stands for Wi-Fi ok. You can see that Zigbee is the lowest uh, power consuming device and also the lowest data rate that you can get from it. Whereas, Bluetooth uh, is slightly more power consuming and also data rates are not comparable in, in any way to uh, the low end uh, Zigbee system and Wi-Fi is again no comparison to what Bluetooth in fact offers and therefore, uh, it is also highly power uh, consuming. So, that is uh, one way and you may also want to know the range right. Zigbee uh, the range can be uh, this can be anywhere between 10 to 100 meters ok this is Zigbee. Whereas, Bluetooth Bluetooth can have uh, somewhere close to 2 to 10 meters or maybe it may be you can stretch it to 20 meters not more than that. If you take Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is really long range ok. It can connect anywhere minimum is 30 meters and a maximum it can go uh, is quite a bit in fact. All right, so, it can go anywhere between 100 and even 150 meters. It is a quite a high data rate uh, and also good range uh, if you are looking at uh, the uh, different technologies. So, you may want to pick that which you think is most suited for your application. 
Now earlier Bluetooth was one thing that people were hesitating uh, to use uh, because it did not have that inherent mesh capability but right now Bluetooth has mesh, Bluetooth mesh is possible ok. mesh is possible ok and that is the reason why some of the times uh, if you have to decide between uh, Bluetooth and Zigbee people would go for uh, Zigbee because uh, Bluetooth did not support the mesh capability. So, mesh brings in a lot of features right it brings in reliability resilience because if there is a link failure on one of the links let us say you take this case this is connected here, here, here and let us say this is connected here, here, here and here and let us say this is connected here it is connected uh, to this and it is also connecting to this and it is also connecting to uh, this guy let us say. Now, see the beauty of this uh, system they are all in close proximity I mean you can go on building the story here for some reason uh, from this node let us call this A and let us call this B. For example, if there is a packet going from A to B and this link broke ok, you can do several nice things is not it. You can give this packet to this node ok and then get this uh, node to actually I have to draw this get this node to communicate to B. Right? So, you will take a detour, but it will start it can self heal if there is a breakage self heal and highly reliable it is also robust and so on. So, a lot of nice things are possible with the uh, robustness because of its ability to withstand any sort of interference the technique itself is uh, very strong direct uh, spread spectrum uh, technique. So, it had its own advantages, but uh, Bluetooth caught up also Bluetooth, Bluetooth also said we can do mesh and therefore, now it is interesting to see what is it that Bluetooth uh, I mean what is it that Zigbee can offer over and above uh, what Bluetooth can offer, but one thing is clear that uh, its resilience is high more suited for more suited for industrial environments and power consumption that definitely Zigbee will far overtake the ability of uh, Bluetooth uh, links. So, this is one aspect of what I wanted to say. The second aspect is uh, if you go into the details a uh, little more into details you will realize that uh, Zigbee or what I now would like to call as IEEE 802.15.4 in general uses uh, a modulation scheme called OQPSK ok and uh, it has a chip rate it supports 16 uh, channels and uh, channel bandwidth is uh, 2 megahertz 2 megahertz 16 of them OQPSK and bit rate bit rate I mentioned to you is 250 kbps kilobits per second symbol rate is 62.5 symbol rate sixty two point five kilo symbols per second typically the uh, symbol uh, rate will be lower right uh, this will be 62.5 k symbols per second ok I just write it like that and it has a beautiful 16 array orthogonal spreading method. So, it has spreading orthogonal 
no I should write it correctly 16 array orthogonal uh, spreading method. Okay. So, these are some really good users I mean uses um, and because of the ability to give you very low data rate it becomes a very attractive uh, system. Now important things about uh, this protocol is known to you let me draw another picture and what I have put here are f here there are f's inside there is a p here okay. So, maybe this is not clear. So, I will draw it big and I will put a p here okay. and I have put a r here and again I have put a, a f here and so on. What this simply means in these uh, in the Zigbee world or the 802.15.4 world is that this is a reduced function device this r is a reduced function device and f is a full function device. Folks there is absolutely uh, uh, I mean I would say nothing to worry about these uh, high sounding uh, terms there is only one difference perhaps between this r and f if you look at f okay take this case of f this f has the capability to receive from another f or from another r and forward the data okay whereas r don't does not have that ability to forward that is only difference it can only be like a edge node it may not have capabilities to forward. So, go back to that uh, uh, XB uh, you know that little PCB I showed you on which there is a chip find out whether you can actually configure it like a F device or as a R device try to connect what you get in the market to what the protocol is saying only then you will be able to effectively use whatever is there in the market uh, because these kind of topologies are important. What is P now? P is a pan coordinator it is called personal area network coordinator okay it is like a gateway device okay pan coordinator. So, that is what is P. Now, if you look at uh, what I have shown here uh, this is like a mesh topology right this is a mesh mesh topology and uh, you will have other types of topologies also like a tree you have uh, let us say uh, uh, two nodes here communicating in turn communicating to another node and maybe uh, it goes this way and it perhaps goes this way and so on right. This is like a tree either you communicate like a tree or you communicate on a mesh that will be something that you will have to determine based on your requirements, but the technology will allow you to do a meshing you have to program them accordingly such that you can put them into a mesh network okay, or you will configure it into a mesh topology uh, if you are looking for certain features. Okay. So, that is a very important uh, aspect of the Zigbee which you can configure. Now, channel access essentially means that if you take timeline no if you take the timeline and it is counting down uh, time is divided this is time axis it is possible that f1 and f2 want to use the channel at the same time f1 and f2 I think we should write it this way. Uh, f1 and f2 both want to use the channel at the same instant in time let us say it is here this instant in time obviously that is going to collide right when you are transmitting at the same time therefore you need mechanisms to go over channel access requires contention and contention free methods. Now the contention based access is essentially what we call uh, carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance and uh, then uh, you can also do uh, non contention based or uh, you can also do uh, beacon enabled uh, method right you can also do beacon enabled I uh, will we will talk about that as we go along in CSMA the idea is that uh, each node 
uh, before it does a transmission looks for some energy it does what is known as an energy detection to see if the medium is free okay it uses its floor noise and checks whether the signal is above the floor noise and so on if it is then it knows that there is a detection there is a transmission going on otherwise it knows that it is free but if it is free it just does not jump in and send a data packet it does some sort of a random back off and then goes back and checks whether the channel is free even after a back off if it finds that the channel is free then it does a transmission this is typical of what carrier sense multiple axis collision avoidance is all about it tries to avoid uh, collision and uh, tries to uh, sort of meet, uh, I mean ensure that uh, it is uh, graceful and tries maximum to ensure that there is only one node and that should be itself that should be utilizing the medium. So, that philosophy is important not always that may be useful uh, it may if you have an industrial environment where you definitely need access to the channel then perhaps you cannot use this because you do not know this is probabilistic sense that you might also not get an access to the channel because if it comes with too many nodes there contentions will start increasing and uh, I as a node I may not even have the, uh, the uh, uh, smallest possible window to do a transmission. So, that is going to end you up in a risky situation. So, for that the same standard 15.4 has defined what is known as beacon enabled uh, standard. So, uh, in beacon enabled what actually happens is the pan coordinator um, you know broadcasts a beacon and divides the uh, what is known as uh, in beacon enabled you essentially have what is known as a, a super frame structure. Okay. In the super frame structure uh, nodes have first of all to begin with they have to try and get hold of a slot. If they get hold of a slot then they can use that slot repeatedly whether they have data or not is not the point they can repeatedly use that slot. So, in so in, in a super flame structure uh, what actually happens is only first time each one of these nodes have to contend and get a slot from the it is like getting a pass you need a pass to go up right supposing you have to pass to uh, permission to uh, start moving up or climbing a hill it is like getting a permission. So, you have to contend somehow uh, you know first come first serve basis or whatever and obtain that pass. Once you have that pass with you then that is it you are given authority uh, a time slot over which you can keep transmitting. So, I think that is a fair enough thing that is what actually happens in beacon enabled uh, uh, transmission. It is not that uh, in the beacon enabled that people cannot contend people can contend there also but there is also a non contention part in the beacon enabled super frame. So, if you open up the super frame you will see contention free and contention based both of them are there within the same slot. I would like and encourage you to look up uh, that uh, super frame structure of uh, Zigbee uh, you know 15.4 so that you understand it uh, much much uh, better. Okay. Now, in uh, beacon uh, enabled uh, you see what all can nice things can happen you send out a beacon and uh, once the beacon is sent out the device can give the data back because its uh, time slot is reserved and once the data comes you can get back an ACK. Okay. This is something that you actually supports between the coordinator and the device. Now, uh, that need not necessarily be the case in the in the non beacon enabled uh, case where you would not have this. Okay. Data transfer can need not be um, if you take uh, non beacon enabled you have data in fact, it will be just this right in the non beacon enabled you will have device sending data to the coordinator and uh, you might get an acknowledgement back in this direction. If it is successful you will get an acknowledgement uh, if it is not you know that your data collided with someone else. So, the notion of acknowledgement has now changed where you have to uh, get an ACK uh, for the data that you took a chance and you uh, transmitted. So, this is for uh, non beacon enabled this picture non beacon enabled.
and for the beacon enabled what would you do? In beacon enabled I will pull this out, but I will also do some nice things here. What I will do is I will send out a beacon, who sends out? The coordinator sends out a beacon, this guy sends out its data, but not in this direction, it will be only in this direction and for which the coordinator may give a acknowledgement. So, you will have three arrows in either direction uh, in the beacon enabled mode. So, all these things can be uh, examined very carefully from the standard and uh, the standard will essentially tell you uh, something nice about how you can use this protocol in a very effective manner. All right, So, let us move on. There are other nice things about this protocol which uh, you may want to use that is related to addressing. Okay. Very important concepts. In addressing it uses two methods, one is called 16 bit short addressing and the other is called 64 bit uh, extended addressing. Okay, both are possible. Simply it means that if you have a smaller network do not go in for 64 bit extended networking, because with 16 bit already you will have 2 power 16 possible addresses for nodes, which is already a large uh, number. And if you use 64 bit you will have 2 power 64 addresses, that means 2 power 64 number of nodes can be there in the network, which in my opinion is very very high. So, try to see if you can manage with that just the 16 bit short addressing which is good enough and um, that will also make the size of the packet smaller and so on. So, this is an important uh, part in the uh, 15.4 stack. Coming to applications as I mentioned there are many applications for Zigbee, one can talk about security systems, security systems as examples, then we can be talking about meter reading, meter reading, okay. then we can talk of irrigation, irrigation, then we can talk of light control, remember the example of blinds I gave you this is something that you can definitely apply Zigbee, well there are other technologies you can also apply this uh, HVAC, heating, ventilation and AC, multi zone systems. Then you can be talking about uh, remote control, okay. you can talk about industrial control or industrial automation. so many uh, applications out there and uh, livestock and so on and so forth. Thank you very much.